good. So yeah. let's see where it goes here. It says meeting is now streaming on Facebook. Thumbs yeah. up. Oh yeah, good. All right. Hey. Oh, All right. Did it. All right. Congratulations. Don, I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it too. I think I will. It's always fun to have these 50 year anniversaries or whatever. Okay, we're up, we're up now. I can see you, Charles. Okay, how do I go? Um, how do I go go full screen? Steve, talk to me. So I mean, basically, again, view, you should be if on view in the upper right corner. The meeting is now. How do and I you go want to speaker? Go full screen? All right, hold on. I got to mute something here. Yes. So I mute my speaker, right? Mm -hmm. Except I'm seeing me in delay. That don't look at Facebook. Oh, okay. I got to get out of there. Yes. Then. Like somebody having their uh, radio on, where they're actually on the radio, right? <laughs> <Yes>. Yep. <laughs> Coming meetings recorded. I don't know what to do here. Let's see. Uh, go there. I moved into shadow zone here. Okay, Steve. I, don't I know like the shadows these days. Steve, take yeah. over. I don't know what to do. I have no clue what's going on now. The You're doing great. So just ignore Facebook, expand the Zoom screen so it fills your computer. Okay. I and don't in, the up, in the upper right corner, you'll have the view choice and you would like to choose speaker if you only want to see the person speaking. I prefer gallery. I'm going to so use you, gallery. I'm going to do just gallery. so you can see everybody, but yeah, you can yeah. switch. You can switch during the show. Okay. That, and how, do, hey. how do I get full screen? Where do I find that? Speaker, just, right? Just manually drag the bottom right corner or left corner oh, and you fill up the, you know, open okay. it. Up. It looks like I'm seeing it on Facebook, though. I'm not seeing the live one that you guys are seeing. Hey, Debbie. Yeah. Can you get a little more light, a little more light on the? Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to go back to the couch um i'll try not to expose myself too much everybody this is a dress rehearsal we're just checking stuff out we're not ready to go live yet so don't pay any attention to what we're doing right now <laughs> we're getting it all together and you know what we used to say in the early days there's something about if they can't take a joke uh yeah, yeah. Supposed to, there's some action you know I, I know what they say at the beginning of that one <laughs> yeah steve i'm just getting the facebook thing i'm not i can't get the but then I, Click on the blue Zoom icon on your dashboard. My dashboard, Zoom icon. Okay, I got that. And that should bring... Oh, up. there you are. We're all live. There we go. Hi, everybody. Charles Laquadera here. And uh, uh, what will soon be Debbie Ullman. And uh, and then uh, below me is wherever, or wherever he is, Joe Rogers. Uh, Mississippi Fats or whatever names he used back in the day, Sam Copper and uh, Don, what's your last name? Law. By the way, everybody, just, just a little bit of uh, a trivia here. Don is pretty famous or well-known in Boston because of all the um, concerts that he promoted. But actually, Don, Don's father is more famous than Don is and was. Don's father... Your dad, were you close to your dad or was he just busy doing all these blues things? What Your dad Your dad was responsible for bringing a lot of blues artists uh, to the forefront and recording them. What, what? So he, um, he has a very colorful story. He's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, he's an Englishman, came over here and um, was, had, had, for... was interested in um, so he, um, a job in New York. Very colorful story. He's getting feedback from him. Oh, hold on. Let me see um, what that is. That's, he's an that's, Englishman. That's, he's got FaceTime going now. Sorry. How about now? Uh, Does it work now? Yeah, it's good for it. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he decides he, he's got a job in New York, then goes south with another friend. They have a farm. They're developing it with um, sheep. They have the large ranch. They get wiped out by a disease, and he, quote, gets on a bus to go west to see what cowboys are like. And he does this during the Depression, and he gets a job uh, with Brunswick that made bowling balls and phonograph records. And he becomes um, uh, somebody who is now recording uh, blues and country music um, in the field. And he meets uh, uh, a guy named Ernie Ertle, I think was his name, who was at a record store, and said, you really should see this. Uh, there's a blues guy named Robert Johnson. I think he's worth recording. 
<clears throat> and so my father um, heard him, liked him, and made arrangements to have two sessions with Robert, one in San Antonio, one in Dallas. And um, the one in Dallas, I guess, you probably know the story about uh, when they're the first time they recorded and um, the, the, he gets arrested. Do I, you know that story, Charles? So he's... Um, tell the story. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, at, at the, he's sitting at uh, dinner with my mother and um, the maitre d' comes over and says, Mr. Law, the uh, police are on the phone. My father goes over to the phone and they say, well, we have, Mr. Law, we have this man named uh, Robert Johnson. We've arrested him for vagrancy. Uh, he says he's working for you. And my father confirms the fact that he is working for him and about to record a session. And so he rushes down, finds Robert who's been beaten up. <clears throat> His guitar has been damaged. He um, gives him, uh, gets him out of jail, gives him money uh, for breakfast and arranges for him to meet to record. And he goes back to dinner with my mother <clears throat> and he's sitting at the table. And um, within a few minutes, the maitre d' comes back over and says, Mr. Law, there's a Robert Johnson on the phone. My father goes over and says, yeah, Robert, what's up? He says, well, Mr. Law, um, it seems that there's a woman here and I'm lonesome and um, I have 45 cents and I lack a nickel. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but anyway, when I was a kid um, on the floor of our house in Connecticut, um, my father pulled out the original recordings and when, he, uh, when they recorded in these primitive environments, um, <clears throat> they were making the record on site. So they actually had ice in the bathtub with a fan flowing over the ice. Um, and they had a bottle of whiskey and there was an engineer, my father and Robert, and they'd all drink, um, keep the ice going because the, the record was actually being made and it would melt if they didn't keep it cool enough. <clears throat> and these original acetates um, they had, and this was on Vocalion, which was a uh, subsidiary of Brunswick at the time. So he put those, uh, those acetates together, those records together and made um, Robert Johnson, King of the Delta Blues Singers, which um, absolutely lifted the head off of people like Eric Clapton and Keith Richards and became sort of a seminal record that uh, many of the British rockers yeah. particularly um, were yeah. uh, found terribly influential. But he did, uh, I think, Bobby Blue Bland, and he did um, Chuck Wills. He did a whole bunch of people. And then later <clears throat> he went to Nashville and um, there was a Quonset hut that Owen Bradley had was recording in. And he um, thought it was sensational. So he went to New York and tried to convince Columbia to buy that studio. Um, they didn't want to do it. They spent a long time, finally convinced him to do it. And it was the beginning of what became Music Row. And he did, um, Johnny Cash and Marty Robbins, and he did the uh, Lester Fatt and Earl Scruggs, you know, the foggy, the, the one that was the uh, theme song for Beverly Hillbillies, and he did, he did a ton of stuff. And in fact, um, his competition internally, and every, this is a year when, an era when everybody was signed to the label. So um, he had, he probably had 35 or 40 artists signed in terms of his segment of the country music side. And there was Mitch Miller, <laughs> over on the uh, popular music side. And he couldn't stand Mitch Miller. He thought he was an arrogant, pompous ass. And he was so delighted that he actually beat Mitch Miller with his country recordings over what Mitch Miller was doing with popular music. But, um, but so anyway, so I sort of grew up and my mother uh, played classical music and um, she really couldn't really abide these hillbillies. Um, so it was really kind of funny that <laughs> you know, she'd be playing Cassidy Sue and my father would come in with Lefty Frizzell and she <laughs> the room, you know? So it was really, um, it was a weird, and, and every, every, literally every closet in uh, our house was filled with 78. So you literally, it was- 78s, you have to explain what 78s are for <clears throat> the younger audience here. 78s, you know, were the older record that spent, span, spawned at a much higher resolution, rep, RPM, and, um, uh, and they were brittle and, uh, and they took up more space. And, um, and so anyway, you opened a closet in our house and the records would just pull out because he at, at one point would get most of the records made. And I remember him coming home and said, Dr. Goldmark has this thing that he's invented. And he put on this uh, long playing record. It was a small one at the time. I think it was Ray Bulger or something. And we said, oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, and that was the beginning of the long playing record because 
uh, Dr. Goldman invented it for, I think, CBS. And uh, was it a 33 or a 45? Was it a 33? It was a 33. I think it was like a 12 and a half or something, or, uh, you know, it was a small RPM. It was eventually the LP came, the 33 came next, and then the uh, 45. But I think so when, so when we so when we uh, were working at the at the uh, at WBCN in the early days on Newbury Street, so this Ray Reap and of course was the fellow who put it all together, and there was his assistant that that we would see, uh, you know, who was kind of like a real preppy guy, had nothing to do with the marijuana, nothing, watch, to do watch, with, nothing to do with with the music in our minds. It was like, who is this straight guy? Is he a narc? Just <laughs> walking up and down the steps, coming to the elevator, just getting all this stuff done, this little kind of gopher boy. And it turned out to be Don Law, uh, who actually had a better musical background than most of us. And, and I, I'm glad you pointed that out. You might say. <laughs> no, I, I've got to give homage to Ray. Um, you know, Ray obviously started both the Tea Party and BCN, um, and he really had an extraordinary vision. And, and um, he's a treasure. I mean, obviously, there were a lot of issues of one sort or another, but he really did see the future. And I, it's, to me, remarkable. He goes to California, spends the summer out there, sees what Tom Donahue has done with radio, and sees what, um, what Graham has done and um, Chet Helms have done with the ballrooms. Besides, he's going to do both comes back and decides he's going to start a ballroom and he's going to go make a deal to convert FM radio. And that's a pretty nervy thing for a guy to do. Who's Steve, doing can you put up Ray Reapin's picture somewhere? Can you find that and just put it up? You're asking me? So uh, I'll, work, I'll work on that and put, post it in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, so I think that, um, and Joe knows Ray about it probably better than anyone because he's been an absolute sweetheart helping Ray and I have been trying to help him as well. And I think you were roommates with Ray, weren't you there? He was, he was, he was my roommate, yes. yes. Yeah. I'm sure it was, it was kind of like... As, as far as roommates go, it's so funny because uh, everyone who's back knows uh, that radio, BCM, back in that time, uh, uh, in 68, 79, 70, 71, 72, remembers Stephen Siegel, who was uh, <clears throat> the Siegel. He had all these nicknames. Later, he became Stephen Clean, <clears throat> the obscene Stephen Clean. But... Of all people, for this preppy guy to have as a roommate, uh, Don Law had, right? Joe, Don Law had Steve. I had Steve Siegel for a while as my roommate, and we definitely were the odd couple. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I was always, uh, you know, we, we operated live in a really hostile environment. Um, the town fathers hated us. Uh, they were convinced that we were hippies selling uh, psychedelics. We were drug dealers. Clearly we had to have or orgies in the background. I mean, this, there's no way this, this dance hall without booze could be surviving without illicit behavior. So we were absolutely under uh, the gun constantly. And, and so during this period, you had the Tea Party. What was going, what did Ray have going? Party, the Tea Party was going and um, and, and we were always getting harassed by building department. You know, we would have a successful night in the building department, try to shake us down. It was thoroughly corrupt. And, and the Tea Party was difficult. You know, it was a very difficult room because it was a second floor uh, ballroom. It was a steep set of stairs. There really wasn't a second good exit. I mean, it was really, frankly, kind of dangerous. Um, and uh, it was very difficult. So we just were constantly dealing with this. So being you know, the notion of getting caught or busted was something that under no circumstances could I do. But then in the meantime, Stephen's doing lines in my apartment, you know, <laughs> yeah. he's got out on the kitchen table. And it's like, Steve. <laughs> but, um, but he is, um, to me, um, you know, we you all know, I think he's just a treasure. I mean, he is such a talent and I, I you know, it was clearly a, um, you know, Ray bringing him in because he did. He's the only one who really had some experience before you came, Charles. Um, you know, and, and we, had, would, we would sit around. Now that's Ray Reapin. Oh, that's me kissing him back at, at one of the. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I remember with, with Stephen, uh, we would sit around. This was a different time for radio. We would sit around Joe Rogers and Sam and I and uh, Debbie and all of us. We'd sit around listening to Stephen. Siegel, his show, because he would say, hey, I've got this album that we just uh, stole from Warner Brothers, or whatever it is, it was 
it was Crosby, I guess uh, uh, the birds had just broken up and uh, Cro uh, uh, David Crosby had, had decided to get form a group with Stephen Stills and it was Crosby, Stills and Nash. And it was like, uh, Stephen had the acetate. It didn't even have an album cover, right? It was just a white album. And we- but, hey, I, I'd like to throw in also about Stephen that uh, he, he picked music, music amazingly well, did amazing segues, but- That, that was that, the thing that absolutely knocked me out. Yeah, but, but beyond the, the music, the man could talk for five minutes and have you on the edge of your seat right. and about anything, whether it was the music or, or sport his cat, or his chat, cat, the microwave, or politics, and you know, <laughs> mostly in radio. But, 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 but it's not, you know, this is as, as somebody who ultimately and maybe inspired by BCN wound up owning five radio stations and employing ex BCN uh, employees. Um, it was really that inspirational time period um, where Steve Siegel had that incredible ability to do all those segues and merge in different uh, you know, uh, musical formats and make it work somehow that nobody thought was possible. How do you merge in classical with blues and rock and roll and make you it- get a, You get a phone call from Steven personally, at Joe or Debbie or Sam or I. If we get a phone call from Steven, all you have to do is go, hi, Steve, how are you? Put it on hold, you can vacuum the house, just mute it. Because yeah. Stephen would go on for an hour with the greatest <laughs> stories, the greatest. But you know, a, a, a terrific talent and a real sweetheart. I mean, a wonderful human being and a real talent. Don, I meant to ask you, what's that behind you? What is that background? Uh, so um, this is this is sort of you know one of the things that every once in a while it's, it gets to be really fun in our business. And um, Barry Marshall is um, a sort of the personal tour director for uh, Paul McCartney. And he takes this, you know, very seriously. And he makes sure that wherever Paul plays, which is not many places, that there's something very special. So if he goes somewhere, uh, Paul has to get a kick out of it, has to like it, but it has to be high visibility. So we were going to play Fenway Park. And um, we were trying to figure out, you know, maybe we could do a, uh, one of these blimps with Lucy in the Sky with diamonds or something, you know, something that would be funny, et cetera. Um, but the blimp was unfortunately in New York for a Yankees game. So Dave came up with the idea, wait a minute, why don't we get one of those, you know, football card uh, crowd, crew of things, where like the USC uh, card thing, where they have a message. So we hired this company out of Florida and they had seven guys who were positioned along, all the way along in front of the stands and every seat had a message. We're gonna do a nice surprise for Paul and we're gonna have two, we're gonna have a ready, and then we're gonna have go. And after the end of his first song, everybody please lift their card. This is Fenway Park. This is Fenway Park. So Paul knows nothing about it. So he finishes his first number and all of a sudden this happens. So if you look, you can see Paul McCartney on stage with his arms out and it says, welcome back, Paul. Wow. Oh. Very cool. Very cool. Oh. So, you know, the fact is that, you know, every once in a while things are really fun. Um, and so he just, he absolutely loved it. And of course, Fenway is one of his favorite places. And if it wasn't for COVID, he probably would have played it. Um, and he's absolutely extraordinary how he goes on for hours, you know, doesn't, he's obviously, he's vegan. Uh, make sure that in the, the venue, including Fenway, that there are plenty of vegetarian choices. Um, he has got an incredible stamina and <laughs> it's oh, he's just a wonder, and of course, it's so much fun to have him. Don, one of the questions that somebody uh, told me to ask you—there are actually two, three. One was about uh, uh, did you did you guys buy a post office? I, I bought a post office in Union Square, Somerville. Sure. You going to uh, go into the postal business? business? <laughs> Don's going to make the mail, the mail move faster again. No, this this doesn't have anything to do with the price of eggs, um, but. Um, you know, Union Square is, uh, Somerville is going to become, is becoming rapidly a terrific location. And uh, they're putting a green line in that should be done early next year. Uh, there'll be about 3 million square feet of development. And there was, the post office was selling this wonderful um, landmarked building that is potentially three stories made in 1936. Wow. And wanted to get rid of it quickly. And so I said, I'll buy it. <clears throat> and so I bought it. Um, Wait, what's going to happen? 
Well, we, you're waiting to see, I mean, we're still figuring that out because, um, you know, it's not easy. We're not, we, you know, it's, we're going to have to wait and see what happens to the economy. Right now, temporarily, we have a robot company in there. So uh, we have a company called Right Hand Robotic. Um, they, uh, they do sorting and so forth, but that's temporary. We have to do a complete rehab of the building uh, at some point. And so next year we'll start. And uh, it'll be some sort of mixed use venue of three stories, but it's a fabulous, beautiful building. Want to hear my next question? Sure. The Rolling Stones played at the Garden and Mick Jagger was, somebody was arrested and Kevin White was the mayor and this happened in Providence. And was this your show, your venue? Charles, you know this story, right? That's all messed up. They landed you know, in Providence. But he's, he's, it's sort of, but he knows the story. He's being cute. <laughs> so tell everybody the story. A lot of people don't know that story. So in 1972, uh, the Stones are playing uh, the Garden, and um, Stevie Wonder was the support, and uh, Peter Rudge was then the tour manager and manager, a good friend. And um, so Stevie Wonder's on stage, and uh, somebody runs over to me and says, uh, "Don, hurry up over here. Uh, Rolling Stone manager's on the phone." So I go over and says, "It's Peter." And Peter goes, "Don, we've really fucked up this time." I said, "What's the matter, Peter?" Said, well, we got fogged out of Boston, and as we're getting off the plane in, in Rhode Island, some photographer came over and he got really aggressive with Keith. And Keith just said, Hey, come on, leave it. And so finally, Keith just kicked the photographer. The policeman there is a photographer, he basically hauls the band off to jail. So he said, Don, we're in jail in Rhode Island. And I said, Stay put, we're going to get you out. So Eddie Powers, uh, and understand this is still the era when this uh, ownership didn't like rock and roll. I mean, they really didn't. You know, we're still we're still barely out of the era where the police are in the front of the of the audience. The audience rushes to the stage. The police beat up the fans and shut down the concert. Right? I mean, so we're not far from that. And so Eddie Powers, who's part of the Adams uh, family, you know, the administration, wonderful older guy. You know, we come in and explain the situation. He goes ash and white. He's convinced now that his building's going to be torn apart brick by brick. But he's got to announce that the Stones were arrested and can't play. So we basically got together and said, listen, let's call Kevin White, who we know has political aspirations. Maybe he can spring them. Call the governor. Kevin White at the time. What was he? Kevin was White was the mayor. Yeah. And let's see if we can get him out. So Kevin actually does. He jumps to it, uh, gets on the phone with the governor. They, they call down to the police station. Uh, when they finally get the message to um, the front desk, the guy looks at the other guy and says, you really fucked up this time. Um, and they put him in a uh, limousine. And then we went out and um, said, Stevie, can you s stretch your last number? And so he's, his last number- Sir ran, Duke was born from that concert. Oh, he played 45 minutes, his last number. And so, uh, you know, I think Powers and all of the management were convinced that the building was gonna get destroyed and of course, you know, we threw out soft toys and footballs and Frisbees and everybody stayed put. They got on at midnight and played brown sugar. They started out with brown sugar. And uh, the next night they gave a special tribute to Kevin White. Uh, but oh, in the process, um, uh, as before, we, we had to make an announcement. So Kevin decides to come down and makes the announcement. And um, he's wearing a white shirt and he comes out on the stage and this the Spotlight is on Kevin. And he goes, um, my city's in trouble. Um, tonight, uh, I have, have um, uh, riots in other parts of the city, which he did. I have to pull the police out of here. Yay! Um, <laughs> I have some bad news. Um, the Rolling Stones were fogged out of Boston and were arrested uh, in Providence. Boo! And George Regan looks at me and goes, you know, Don, Kevin's much better at questions than answers. <laughs> But I've gotten them out and they're on their way. Uh, so that was the, um, the story. And um, it was, it was uh, his hair. I, hair and just, uh, I just, this is a little news flashes aside from all this, but uh, if any of you out there are uh, familiar with Bill Maher's TV show, every Friday night, he always complains about the, uh, the, the lockdown. He complains about wearing masks. He complains about all this overhype of the COVID. Bill Maher just got COVID. They just announced it. No. Yeah. So it's just no. kind of like, you know, it's he almost like uh, with, he, with that, he, he just got COVID. But he, he just, didn't get vaccinated. I mean, that's bizarre. Uh, 
I don't think he got vaccinated. I would yeah. bet he are. Huh. Anyway, it's called Schadenfreude for those of you who know German. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so Debbie, this is uh, a I'm, I, you, before you ask Don, me, I want to say I was in the second row for that very long Stevie Wonder opening set and that very late start. I'm almost positive. And it was the best tickets I ever had to a Rolling Stone concert. <laughs> yes, I don't know if I, who yes, I got sir. them from or how I wound up in the second row. And I didn't realize that there could have been a police encounter and that that was a, a dangerous place to be. But I do remember that concert. Well, no, it wasn't because the police were pulled out. Right, exactly. Pulled out of the venue. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Well, he, 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 had, really, he, had, uh, he had some rides in the South End. Was it, Debbie, wasn't there a thing where you, you were hitchhiking? And somebody oh. picked you up, and they, they had some famous people in the car. Who would that, who might that I, have been? I was on Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge. I don't know why I was hitchhiking. It, I could have walked almost anywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, a van came along, and Don was driving. And I got in the back, and I was surrounded by Joe Cocker and his band. I don't expect <laughs> Don to remember that, but. They, because the VW bus broke down? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the bus yet. <laughs> so yeah, but I so I actually the, the um one of the one of the great stories about uh and Joe knows this really well uh, um you know about Ray um as he talking about Ray Ray, Ray, he's never liked party, yeah. and uh and so he had a Porsche and he was visiting a girlfriend on Beacon Hill and he illegally parked and the um uh the police towed his Porsche and he got so pissed off. He didn't have a license. He marches down to the bottom of the Beacon Hill to Charles Street. There's a VW dealer there now, which where there's a garage now. He buys himself a Volkswagen camper bus. With the flowers on it? No, it was just a beige camper bus. Yeah. And that became my vehicle. And I wound up picking up people like Jeff Beck or um, Led Zeppelin in the Volkswagen camper bus. And one time the damn bus broke down, I remember with Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck in it. And Jeff's a real car guy. And so he's, under, and it was in Cambridge. And he's underneath the car with his fancy boots and, and, and Stewart's all pissed off. And <laughs> no, Don, I remember. I wish I'd been there then. I, I caught the Joe Cocker riding. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the VW camper bus though. I mean, eventually I had to migrate. I had to get out of that. But for a while, it was the thing I had to drive everybody in it. When, when we were working on uh, WBCM, we were uh, being DJs. We'd, uh, it was kind of like we would help out each other. Uh, we'd work together. I remember getting a call from uh, Don and he'd say something like, uh, hey, Jeff, I remember one call was kind of sad, Don. I remember, and, and you'll have to fill in the blanks here, but I remember I was on the air and you called up and Jeff Beck had put out an album. I'm not sure it was the Rod Stewart album, the Jeff Beck Rod Stewart uh, album. The truth, it's called but, the truth. But which the truth. album, which album had a long Nicky Hopkins solo? The truth. It was called the, the truth. truth. Yeah. So, yeah. The so when that, when you, you called up and you said, hey, the Tea Party, you know, a lot of people we could use for more people, could you announce it? But then you told me something about Jeff Beck and, uh, and he had some mental issues. And Nicky Hopkins' song was about that, that long. I, I'm not confused. No, no, actually, that. It, that the, it was a girl from Mill Valley is the song you're talking about. And that was the song that we used at the end of every night at the tea party. Yeah. Uh, beautiful piano piece that Nicky Hopkins did. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what, um, what I remember uh, about that experience the first time around was, um, and that album was amazing. And I obviously I hadn't, seen them sort of before well, none of us had seen him and so the first night that he played um i was standing back there and of course he cranks up uh and i still think he was always a great lyrical guitar player particularly in what he was playing then and i was absolutely knocked out so i went back um being very much a fan and i walk in on the dressing room and uh beck is chewing out rod stewart and ronnie wood you wankers we gotta play better. We can't play like this. I'm going, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> I walked out. But what was really interesting about it was um, the, the there was a difference between the English bands that came through and the bands in the West Coast. Uh, and it was not just the drug issue. 
It was that there was a, app, we're gonna make it, we're gonna do whatever we, we're gonna have to be, we're gonna have to be great every night. That wasn't true for the West Coast bands, we all know it, they were really uneven. Uh, but the Brit British bands came through with, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to knock them out every night. And they really worked hard. You know, I think Charles would, would be interesting um, to talk about Ray's risk, which I think should be um, pointed out in that the environment uh, that Ray took the risk of doing the ballroom, um, you know, we were, that <clears throat> came at a time when, it, you know, the whole live music business was all about having a bar. And you had bar owners who put a stage in the corner. And, um, and the only person that we, and that sort of evolved, and, and it was, you know, maybe you got paid, maybe you didn't. Nobody paid much attention to the talent per se. Um, the mob was involved, a lot of bars, et cetera. And um, Doug Weston, for instance, who opened the Troubadour, uh, had the charming uh, requirement that if you played for him in LA because he was the dominant player, you had to give him either three options or five options. So Elton John had to give him five options. James Taylor had to give him three or five options. What's that mean? What does that mean? If you play, if you play the Troubadour, which was the place to play in Los Angeles, you had to guarantee that Doug Weston had the next four plays or five plays in Los Angeles. Okay. Wow. So what happened is um, uh, there was a, a guy, <laughs> and Charles, we, you talked, we talked about this. Uh, before the only agent in the history of being inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is this guy Frank Barcelona. He's the only one that's ever been inducted. That's one of the questions I had. Who is so, Frank Barcelona? So, so I'll tell the story. So here's a guy who grows up in Staten Island, New York. He's a, he's totally enamored with country music. He wants to be a country music star. He develops a talent for yodeling. He, he comes up with the name Greg Mitchell, goes on the road on the tour to be a country music singer. So obviously that doesn't go very well. And he talks his way into General Artists Corporation to be a cub agent. And at that time, um, rock and roll was kind of the, the hind end for music. Um, nobody gave it much credibility. Nobody uh, thought much of it. Uh, it got second class treatment. So Frank does, is involved with doing the first uh, Beatles tour, doing the Rolling Stones and decides he's gonna do his own um, agency, which is gonna be devoted just to rock and roll. This is in England, right? It's the US, US and England, US and England. So he decides he's gonna start his own agency out of New York called Premier Talent and um, starts signing bands. And, um, and so at the time we had competition for the Tea Party, we had, Crosstown bus and there was the ark. Yeah, and um, and the psychedelic supermarket. And George Papadopoulos was kind of the guy who was probably closer to what we were doing. And um, Frank doesn't know any better. So he called and, and Frank has got, um, you know, he signed up uh, Freddie and the Dreamers, Her Herman the Hermits. He's got a bunch of English acts. So he calls up George Papadopoulos and says, uh, George, was Papadopoulos underworld, under mafia? No, no, no. So he calls it just so um, he calls up and George had this charming habit. Um, he he uh, uh, <laughs> was less than honorable to acts that was that's being very charitable. And um, his habit was often if there was a line down the street, he put a get a chair out and climb up and change the ticket price while they're waiting in line for the most invention. <laughs> that was just fine. And um, that that's was entrepreneur for you. So anyway, so he Frank calls George Papadopoulos and says, um, I'm Frank Barcelona. Uh, I have a new agency named Premier Talent. And, I, and he, before he can finish, George says, wait, 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 wait. You've got what, Freddie and the Dreamers and Hermits, Hermits? He says, yeah, but I want to talk to you. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm George Papadopoulos. I don't want anything to do with you or your agency. And Frank says, wait, you give me the chance to finish. No, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm really not interested. And gives him the bums rush. Frank hangs up and says, you know, I think I'm going to go visit those guys at that other place, the tea party. So I'm sitting in there and in comes Frank Barcelona. And of course, he knows that my father, you know, was a major figure in country music. So we spend talk about country, uh, country music, et cetera, for a while. And then he's the one who basically uh, then books, helps me, you know, turns me on to these bands. So we start booking the Jeff Beck group. Um, and so I have the Jeff Beck group playing and after they play, Rod Stewart throws out a soccer ball and they're all playing soccer and the thing. And 
Peter Grant is the manager. He's a big, enormous guy. And he's got this acetate. And he says, I have this uh, new band called the New Yardbirds, but I think we're going to change the name to Led Zeppelin. And here's the acetate. So we sit in there with Frank and I and going, Peter, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, we wound up with, you know, essentially, you know, Jethro Tull, Joe Cocker, 10 years after, The Who for three days. Um, and, and people have to understand that these groups, no one has heard of these groups before, before these. This the other thing, thing you have to understand is this is in a 750 capacity ballroom. <laughs> you know, this is a small room. So you are really on top of this. Now, the funny thing about it is when Zeppelin played, um, and actually, uh, Jimmy Page just tweeted about this uh, just about six months ago about the Tea Party and, and, and gave me a shout out, et cetera, that I was nice enough to let them play. They kept playing and the, the audience wouldn't let off the stage. And so they ran on material and they started doing Beatles covers. And, Led Zeppelin? <laughs> Led Zeppelin. Yeah. They didn't have any material. So, and, so, and so Peter, like, just six months ago, did a little tweet, did a tweet about playing the Tea Party how it was, it helped them break in, in uh, America. It gave a nice shout out to me. Um, and that they ran out of material and kept playing <laughs> whatever they could come up with. And because they, they, they played for hours. And uh, so he was uh, tweeting about it recently. This was sort of fun. But anyway, um, yep. so it was, um, it was a huge sea change. Um, thanks to George Papadopoulos, who was arrogant enough <laughs> not to take it. Right. I don't want any group yeah, called I, I the, the Yard Birds. Get them out of here. I got a question. Yeah. Don, I think of you and the late Freddie Taylor as the two most significant promoters of music of all sorts in, uh, in the, since the 19, late 60s. Your thoughts on Freddie? Love Freddie. Actually, I worked in the same office with Freddie. Um, when I was a, a student, you know, I was a college booking agent. And that's part of how I read, met Ray. Um, but he, um, you know, he had a one, uh, first of all, I was, as a, as a teenager, I was a big uh, blues and then a jazz fan. And so I would go to New York to watch Thelonious Monk and Charles Mingus and um, Mose Allison. And, uh, and that's why I put Roland Kirk on with The Who, uh, which I'll oh, tell Oh man, you. I remember that one. No, I'll tell that story. Oh, <laughs> that's the best that that. ever best. Uh, and so uh, I was a huge jazz fan and I had gone to the Newport Jazz Festival and I was in, uh, I got in the box, got my way into the box where some of the Columbia guys were. were. Um, and there was a guy named Bob Messenger in there. <clears throat> and, uh, and he brought, yeah, I went down to Second Beach and the, they had Ola Tunji and Don Cherry and others played on the beach, et cetera, after the concert. And I was like, this is, this is heaven. And um, so I got in, getting to know um, uh, the guys there. Um, so uh, he winds up going to work in uh, with Freddie Taylor's office, HT Productions. So I wind up getting a job to be a college booking agent while I'm still in school. I wind up managing Barry and the Remains, and I get yeah. them a contract with Epic Records and bring in the law, cool. the, the Lost, and a bunch of others. And um, so I work with Freddie, and I just thought he was an absolute charmer. I mean, he. Uh, he was very sophisticated. He was absolutely delightful. He uh, was totally committed to jazz. <clears throat> I think he was, he's a, you know, absolutely a giant. He was fabulous. But brought, brought, uh, committed to jazz, but brought in some fairly significant early rockers. I mean, you, you know, of course, we live broadcast from his venues and your venues over the years. And I'll never forget doing Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at their first Boston appearance in town. <laughs> yeah, no, I, in all sorts of I, I loved it. You know, I always get, gave him grief about the never, you never spend any money on that. And there was my favorite line about the uh, Paul's Mall was that um, <clears throat> um, somebody <clears throat> told Buddy Rich that Freddie had renovated Paul's Mall. And he said, what did he do, change the light bulb? <laughs> 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 but Freddie was great, and he did. And he um, he obviously was first. He had Billy Joel. I mean, in fact, Billy Joel was in there one night, and the power went out. And Billy had to play. Somebody had to bring him a candle to finish the set. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why the power went out, but um, so he was first on a number of things. And I think actually Jimmy Buffett played there first. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so. Bob Marley and uh, Springsteen early on. So uh, yeah. 
So it was, yeah, he was, he was. It was a man, uh, uh, a man of his word, uh, oh, you know, in the last years doing lives and scholars with him, you know, it was like all pretty much verbal deals and, and always stuck with uh, old school. Right. And I think, you know, he, um, he, uh, he was a very well-rounded, sophisticated human being, uh, which was sort of not typical of the music business. And you could talk yeah. to Freddie about anything. And uh, he always had a fabulous sense of humor. Uh, he- uh, Sit down comedian. What's that? He called himself the sit down comedian. He really was. Oh, don't go. Oh, those, Fort, oh the Fort Fred Taylor Belt. jokes. The Fred Taylor jokes, forget Fort about it. Oh, it's great. <laughs> so, Don, hey, I, have, the, I have one other quickie question. Uh, Don, we were doing a live broadcast from the Paradise one time, and I can't remember for sure the act. It might have been Elvis Costello, but somebody, well, the manager and you had some sort of tip, and he was wearing this button, I fought the law. And I said to the guy, hey, the next lyric is in the law one. So <laughs> what was that about? <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it happens every once in a while. I have no idea. That's pretty unusual, actually. Yeah, no, uh, I know, yeah. I, I, uh, I honestly don't know, and it might have been, you know, the problem is you got all the, the things like merchandising deals, you know, where, you know, I wanted, my band wants no commission on the merchant, I don't know, you know, or we want part of the bar or some, I don't know, whatever something. And it's like, you have to have rules or you, you, you know, particularly in a small business like the Paradise, you know, it, it really doesn't make any money. The Paradise um, small rooms are there as sort of the farm system for acts to get developed. So you, did, you, you really have to defend the limited amount of money they make because they don't make much money. Yeah. The Paradise lost money for many, many years. Most of its existence, it didn't make any money, you know, but it was kept, it kept it alive because it was so important in the whole um, chain of, of progression for acts. Steve, I wanted to ask you, are you, you see all on Facebook. We're live on Facebook now, right? So yes. are, there any, are, are people asking any questions that Don... <laughs> As a matter of fact, there was most of them in the saying that they love these stories. They're fantastic. Thank you. But hey, Christopher, Christopher Mori just asked, did Don go to BU and was he booking shows at BU when he was younger? I did. Um, and I, I actually got hired uh, by the administration. Uh, they paid me uh, to do that. Um, and you were a student? When I was a student, uh, I booked Vanilla Fudge at the Armory. Um, I did. Uh, I'm having a flashback here, Don. <laughs> I did, uh, uh, what's this? Wilson, the comedian. I did a whole bunch of stuff, um, and then I and I think and then I did a I did a series there uh, of Evolution of the Blues, and I think it was and I got great press on that. I think the Times or somebody, and I brought in. Muddy Waters, Otis Spann, I had Dick Waterman, I had uh, a producer from uh, Columbia. I had a lot of great talent and I, I set it up. Um, uh, I had a fabulous sort of design for the whole thing. And I did this series week after week. <clears throat> and I think that's how I met Reapin. Um, as a result. And I think because I'd been a college booking agent and I'd obviously managed Barry and the Remains who'd done well and actually wound up on the Beatles tour as it turns out. Um, <clears throat> but, um, so um, it was, um, you know, out of that, et cetera. Um, but um, it, it my, just my, a wonderful where, where story. Those concerts, the, those concerts you just described, where do those happen? Uh, which, I mean, which, which one are you talking about? The, uh, the, uh, the History of the Blues series. That was at BU. That was at BU. At a, at a. At the, uh, it was at the Sherman Union. Okay, All right. Sherman Union. And uh, I had a, in fact, I was Bob Driscoll, a designer. Yeah. I, I had a designer did the set for this. Um, and Driscoll, of course, did, I think, some of the best posters we ever did, like the Led Zeppelin arrow, where we did arrows all around the building, et cetera. And I, Driscoll, and Driscoll did Kill, Ugly, Kill uh, Ugly Radio, the first WBC. That's right. That's right. We promoted right. everywhere on all the buildings, et cetera. And so Driscoll, I think, did our set stuff. So that may have where I got to know him as well. He was really talented. I love the, that Led Zeppelin arrow that we just put all the way around the corner of buildings and stuff. Hey, Joe, if you had to, if we were doing a roast of Don, which of course we would never do, but if we were doing a roast of Don right now, what would your story be of? of Don Law and something you might remember in all of the years that you guys have known each other. 
questions. No, I just had more questions. I want to hear more about booking the early bands that as they came in and what. what and I want to hear about how were they? Yeah. How how were those bands for you? Um, when you w w did, especially the ones who ended up being uh, crashing at your apartment. How were yeah, the we bands? Know the back band? story. How the back story. Story. Right. As, uh, that story. That story. That story is well. First of all. Um, the Tea Party, I think the most uh, famous calendar, or famous poster is the calendar in May of 69, um, which is uh, still extraordinary in the sense that, you know, it has three days of the Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood, three days of the Who doing Tommy, then three days of Led Zeppelin, then Delaney and Bonnie, <clears throat> and, and supporting uh, the Velvet Underground, Yep. On that week, on that weekend, um, was a band that had never played out of Georgia called um, the Almond Brothers. Almond Brothers, and they were living. Uh, part of the band were living in my um, my apartment, and this came about really because um, John Landau, who of course has been the manager for Bruce Springsteen for many years, and John and I were friends. And actually, <laughs> I managed them for about five minutes, uh, and he was became a, a associate editor of Rolling Stone magazine, wrote for the Times. John remains a good friend, but anyway, at the um, <clears throat> he became uh, because he was so talented. He became friends with Ahmed Erdogan and Jerry Wexler, and they had uh, had Otis uh, Redding. It was Atlantic <laughs> Records. Atlantic. It was Atlantic. No. Atlantic Records. They had Otis Redding, and um, and the Otis's manager was a guy named Phil Walden out of Macon, Georgia. And Walden decided he wanted to start his own label. And so he took um, session guys out of Muscle Shoals, uh, which was Dwayne Ullman, I think his, his brother Greg was in it too, <clears throat> and put him in a band and um, called him the Owen Brothers. And so in conversations in New York, uh, uh, John and, and uh, uh, Jerry Wexler, we, we started debating how, did, how do we can get him some exposure. And, and John said, listen, I'll call my friend Don Law and we'll send them to Boston and they can play. And so um, they sent them up. I put them up in my apartment, part of them. And then we put free concerts on. And one of the other interesting things, which there isn't a lot talked about, but we did a lot of bands free in the Cambridge com uh, yes. Commons. Yes. Common, and uh, it was really a blast. And so the Almond Brothers played all the time. We had them out there and, you know, we get small crowd, et cetera. <clears throat> and um, and my maybe my <clears throat> my least favorite BCN moment about this uh, Roman Brothers is I'm sound asleep at three o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, it's <laughs> my door, and I don't pay it. it, it I start <laughs> out again. I finally get up and go to the door and say, "There is an emergency on BCN. <clears throat> Dwayne Allman wants you to open the tea party so we can go jam." Not <laughs> 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 to be kidding. <laughs> so I went down, opened the tea party, so he could jam with, you know, I don't know, was Frank Zappa or Eric Clapton. Or um, but, um, but I think your answer is that, um, you know, I, uh, I, Dwayne Ullman's death was tragic. I mean, they're all, I mean, so many of them are tragic, but he was, he was a very sweet, human being, incredibly talented, lyrical. It was a really sad moment to see him pass away in that motorcycle accident. Um, so that was a that was a big thrill for me. You know, I, I was talking with Charles about, <clears throat> and I'm sure it's true for all of you, <clears throat> that period of late 60s, like 67 through 71, is still, of all the decades I've been involved, is my favorite time because there wasn't a business. You know, I mean, as you guys were making it up on the radio, we were making it up live. There wasn't, there was no concert business. There was no touring business. <clears throat> there was no history of this. And um, we were playing it by ear, you know, doing free concerts. Um, and, and it was just a blast. And of course, you know, I could get away with driving Led Zeppelin around a Volkswagen camper bus. I um, remember, I remember but, one, one night I'm on the radio and uh, uh, the, the listener line person, Kate Curran, Kate Curran Rooney, she comes in and says, there's, there's some guys downstairs that I think we were on Stewart Street or maybe, I don't know, yeah. whatever. Stewart. Some guys downstairs want to come in. They just played one played at the Ark, the other one played at the at the Paradise or the Tea Party, whatever. And they want to come up and they they like to play a little bit. And so this was like I was doing the tenant night 
to 2 p.m. Uh, to 2 a.m. shift. I said, yeah, bring him up. So it was like, uh, you know, 1130, close to midnight. And uh, it, it was Dwayne Allman, Jerry Garcia, uh, uh, Greg Allman, and, uh, and some, a couple of guys from Grateful Dead. They just sat there. And you know these these weren't oh worship worship these gods these guys were just musicians we were all we were all sort of together the disc jockeys promoters the musicians there was there were no like real super superstars that we all adored these were just people we just loved sitting around and playing There's so many stories so many well, Don I want know, to ask you who, who you 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 talk about the groups that you liked and the musicians you liked. But were there any, in all the years that you were doing this, you had to have some assholes. I just want to know about just two assholes, one or two assholes. I have, I have, I'll tell a story, which I, I'm sure you may have heard before, I've told before. Um, so, you know, you have tolerances where you have to get things right. And, you know, the, the, uh, Van Halen had the joke about the brown M&Ms and so forth in their writer. Was uh, that true? Yeah, but it was a joke to make sure people read the detail in the 30 okay. page, right? To make sure they got all the detail. Yeah. Who, who's so, writer was this? I'm sorry. Van Halen had a, it had oh, a writer, a yeah. long writer, but they put it in there. They have to have brown M&Ms in the dressing room. Um, so there was there was something unusual about this one British band. Um, it was actually Emmett and Thomas. Um, and they required a, a, a mineral water, drinking water, that was not immediately available. And so I had, we had to order this way in advance. We stocked up on a lot of it. And we're playing the old Boston Garden and it's summertime. What, well, who was the group? Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Yep. So, um, and um, a little bit of attitude, but anyway, so they have this particular middle water and um, we have cases of it. It's a hot day. The garden isn't as near conditioned. I have a you know crappy fan overhead, and of course I see their road crew is drinking this exotic mineral water. So oh geez. Um, so anyway, we get down to um, the last hour, you know, before the show. Road manager comes to me and says, "Don, we got a crisis. Yeah, we're out of the mineral water. Yeah, your your crew drank it all. Well, the fact is they're not going to go on unless you get more of it." I said, "You are joking." I said, "No, I'm not joking." Unless you get more of that mineral water, we're not going on. So <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, I think I can find a really good mineral water, probably out of Maine. I think they'll satisfy you. I'll get you a sample of it. Give me about 20 minutes, a half an hour. This works. Hopefully you'll go along with it. I said, all right, give me a sample. So about 20 minutes later, I came back with a sample of the water, gave it to him. I said, I came back after about 10 minutes. I said, all right, Van says it's fine. We're okay. It was uh, obviously um, MWR, it was Boston Garden Water. Tap <laughs> <laughs> water. The only thing I could do. Hey, <laughs> can I just say, you know, the, 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 those of us on, on this little gathering right now, we've known each other for 53 years. And Don, I have never heard 95% of what you've told us. It's just wonderful stories. Such, this is one. I got to stop doing it. <laughs> it's great. One of the, I remember one time, uh, a lot of times uh, groups don't, groups get much bigger uh, after, after the, the lead singer passes away. And I think there's a ex good example of that, of course, with the doors. And, and I remember, Don, we had a conversation um, way back where I was talking to you about uh, this group Nirvana that I liked. And you said, <clears throat> something like, yeah, they're not as, uh, you know, they, they, they came, they were really big, and now we're having trouble, you know, uh, bringing people in. That was before Kurt Cobain uh, committed suicide. So some groups actually blossomed after, you know, after they passed away. It was just, just kind of a weird thing to... <clears throat> it's true. I, I'm going to tell, I don't know, you probably know this story uh, about Reapin. Um, which Again, I, Ray Reapin, for those people who don't know, Ray Reapin was the guy, a lot, there's a lot of new listeners here. This is about the doors. You mentioned the doors, and this is about the doors. Um, and um, uh, in the early days of the Tea Party, um, it was, there were two names on it. It was Filmmaker Cinematheque, the Boston Tea Party. 
The filmers, filmmaker Cinematheque was with Andy Warhol and Mel Lyman. They were to do experimental films, you know, and they, that was the whole idea. And they do these dances on the weekend. So uh, Crosstown Bus this one weekend, uh, it finally books the doors. And we go, oh, shit, how are we going to compete? So Ray says, I got an idea. <clears throat> and he starts promoting B and Andy Warhol's next movie. So they get Klieg lights out. And I, you know, we probably had hallucinations. You know, we probably had, you know, a band that nobody cared about. And we have all the lights are out, you know, and, and the cameras and so forth. And we sold out. <laughs> I'm not even sure there was film in the camera. <laughs> but, uh, um, and I think we did even better than the doors, I think, because. Did we, Joe and Debbie, did we, and Sam, did we play? Did we, we didn't play the doors very much from what I remember. In, in, when, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, remember. Oh, yeah. I, remember. No, the, I was on the air the when season. Jim Morrison died. And I certainly uh, played, played him more. Song. I just, I don't know. I don't remember. demanded doors. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah we oh, played yeah, the doors played plenty. Them. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking? I'm going back too far. I'm thinking back when I was at, um, before I came to BCM, when I was in Pasadena at KPPC, the Doors were kind of a pop group. And I remember we did, at KPPC, we didn't play the Doors. Yeah, remember? no, I think it was, I think there was a, there was a real knock against them. Absolutely right, Charles. And in fact, um, you know, Morrison, um, you know, would came out and he played the, the Boston Arena and, uh, you know, took his pants down, you know, exposed himself. Now, again, understand the environment we had back then. That wasn't going to work. He got arrested. You know, the concert was stopped because he was exposing himself. I mean, just it was stupid, immature behavior. Uh, that was at the Boston Arena? It was at he the Boston Arena. did that in Miami, too. Somewhere. I I didn't, okay. it at the Boston Arena, got arrested. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Wow. Had you booked it? Was that your... Game? No, 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 no. I, okay. no. I did not book it. I did not. But you know, whoever did obviously <laughs> had a wee bit of a problem. Um, they had to refund the money. A couple of more questions or notes from the uh, the Facebook group. Sure. Uh, first, Ann Thibault remembers you spinning in your office chair when she came to see her father, Charlie Thibault, at the Ark. Okay. <laughs> and um, several people were asking, any thoughts of a book? Really? Um, well, actually, Larry Maggot, who um, it had the, the, the I think sort of back up. Um, what happened as uh, in the late 60s um, is it's that really this, and because of what Chet Helms had done, and then later Bill Graham, um, and because of what Frank Barcelona and then later Flip Spar did, um, an important circuit developed around the country. And um, it was uh, these ballrooms, and it was, uh, it was the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, Avalon and Fillmore East in San Francisco, the Aragon in Chicago, um, the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit, Electric Factory in uh, Philadelphia, um, Fillmore East in New York, and then the Boston Tea Party. So that became, if you were gonna break in America, all of a sudden that became the way to go. And so Larry had the um, Electric Factory in, in uh, Philadelphia and he's to toyed with it and so he, <laughs> is sending something to me and along with Peter Rudge, who was the manager of the Stones and the Who there for a while. Um, and so I don't know, I, I'm, he talked about maybe doing a video. I think, a, I think a book would be more fun. Um, and uh, I don't know. So we'll see, but possibly uh, because it was, it was so crazy. I, I'll tell the story um, that, you know, would have only happened then, which I think you, Charles, you probably know this one about Van Morrison the tea party with fire the fire yeah, yeah. so anyway um <laughs> so the tea party was truthfully kind of a fire trap and um um mitch blake who was a fabulous maintenance guy oh right uh, i remember mitch i remember mitch yeah. i wanted to ask you about him yeah. who's this you're talking about Man mitch blake who was the maintenance guy at the uh took care of the building okay. very con the yoga he, yeah seen. very conscientious um he had a long ponytail, beard, um, very fussy. He was, I think he was, he might've been vegan. I think he was vegan. Anyway, so he and I kind of ran the building and that was it. Um, and uh, because it was a wooden building and dangerous, um, nobody was allowed up 
beyond the balcony into the attic area that overlooked the um, stage. So there was a big fan overhead. You could see down into the stage, but because it was an old wooden building, that was really um, uh, off limits. No staff could go up there. So um, Van Morrison's playing this one night and I'm on the floor and I look up and there are now flames coming out of the roof. And I'm going, we're gonna die. So I rush to the stairs, I grab a fire extinguisher and Mitch is right there too. And he grabs a fire extinguisher. We both rush up the balcony into the, uh, into the attic over um, floor. And we both unload everything we got in our fire extinguishers realizing that if this doesn't work, we're, in, we're gonna die. So fortunately, <clears throat> everything in those fire extinguishers got it out. The um, flames went out, you know, smoke started to clear. Now, meanwhile, all of this debris is falling down onto the floor. Van Morrison is singing. So Van Morrison has the presence of mind. He's singing a song called Up the Ladder. And he keeps singing, you know, really to his credit. So no panic, he keeps singing. So I go back to the floor and I go over to security guard and I'm saying, all right, there was a fire up there and all this water came down. It's all over the floor. What did the crowd say? He said, one of them looked at me and said, far out, light show. <laughs> <laughs> Don, somebody, what, some listener uh, wrote, um, has the restoration fee at the Orpheum, did you finally get air conditioning in there with all those restoration fees we were paying? No, I think the fact is that the Orpheum is the, first of all, the Orpheum is owned by the Drucker family. Um, and they, they, you know, the, 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 they've done a, they're trying to hold it together to keep that building going. And um, it's the oldest continuing, continually operating theater in the city. Actually, that has an amazing history. Um, that it was uh, the home for a lot of meetings for abolitionism. Uh, there was when it was called the Music Hall. Uh, it's where the Boston Symphony or Orchestra started. Um, and um, the, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a chance at one point uh, back in the 80s, I think, early 80s maybe, when Sarah Caldwell had her Boston Opera Company. And she was talking to Bert Drucker, the father, <clears throat> about possibly um, making a long-term commitment to uh, moving there, which means that they would have blown out the stage house, made a large stage, and renovated the theater, putting in air conditioning and doing everything else. Um, at the 11th hour, Sarah Call and, well, and, and Bert Drucker is prepared to write the check. He's committed to this. The 11th hour, Sarah Caldwell bolts and goes down the street and buys the Savoy, which he turns into the opera house. Um, so what happened at that junction is there is no prime tenant. The only way the theater can be supported is by, you know, concerts, which aren't that many. Uh, and there really isn't the money. Now we're slowly doing work. I mean, we, it's a, again, the oldest continuing operating theater in the city with the best acoustics. I mean, every James Taylor's recorded there, Allen Brothers recorded there. It's got great acoustics. But it's, you know, and we continually sort of upgrade it with some painting. We're gonna redo the seats down in the orchestra area. <clears throat> and so every bit of the money is spent on that. But you can't go in and completely do tens of millions of dollars in renovation because there is no prime tenant. You know, Broadway across America that has Hamilton playing for nine weeks plays up the street at the Opera House. The ballet is at the Opera House. You know, what isn't there is obviously playing at, um, at the Wang, et cetera. And the stage house is too small <clears throat> to do most of the production. So there really isn't a lot of chance to, um, to, uh, to uh, improve that very much, but every penny goes into it and it's slowly getting better, um, but it'll never have air conditioning, I don't think. Um, unless is, uh, is COVID now going to end? Is it going to end? Like, what's the future of concerts? How soon is everything going to be back to normal, in your opinion, from what you hear? Well, I think it, it all depends on Governor Baker and our um, interim mayor, Janie. Uh, right now, uh, we think the data suggests that we should be back in business by July. Um, I just, wow. Linsky, who is the head of CDC, was just on TV earlier as we were talking, saying <clears throat> that if you're vaccinated, um, you don't need to wear a mask anywhere. My hope is that that will uh, open things up. Unfortunately, um, um, we're, the, the, we're in the worst position in Massachusetts. We, 
<laughs> we're in the best position in terms of vaccinations. We are at the highest, Vermont and Massachusetts are the two highest in the country. We have less than 10% of our population doesn't want to get the vaccine, um, but we are the, the, we are the furthest behind in open. Um, New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, now Maine, Pennsylvania, New Jersey are all opening up in May and June. So uh, August is what he's saying. We're hoping he's going to move to July 1. So I think uh, my guess is sometime this summer. Is it because there's so many passports? people all together, so close together in Boston compared to Vermont and compared to other people? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the, the real question is how, how are they going to play that? But my guess is if, you, if you've got 85% plus vaccinated, um, then, you know, you should be okay. Will they be doing vaccine passports? Well, I think New York State is looking at that, but the question is whether that's legal. And some think it's not, and our governor doesn't want to do that. So Baker does not agree with that. So, um, uh, but the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I, the sense is you may not be able to force that. Okay, well, I think uh, we've, uh, we've just about finished on. I'm sure you've got a thousand more stories. We should maybe do this again. No. <laughs> we should maybe do this once a month, huh? No, no. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's, it's great fun, uh, as always, Charles, to see you and, uh, and everybody else here, Sam and Debbie and Joe. And, and Steve and, Roos, thanks and, for putting this together. That, that was wonderful. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys share my enthusiasm, but I, this, this is the most fun period that I ever had, those first few years where, you know, the whole culture was shifting like a tsunami under our feet. It was really I consider great. it my formative years. And don't forget, I was the oldest guy. I, I, I think remember. I started at BC. We haven't forgotten. I started at BC, I think, when I was 30 years old or something. And the BC, all the other announcers would 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 say, what is, Lockwood Air is 30? He hasn't made it yet. It was like, yeah, but those are my formative years. I, I just remember that's when I really started blossoming and, and, and getting into what we, all the stuff that was happening in, in America and in Boston. Boston was definitely a Mecca and it was great. And Don Law, you were, as Sam pointed out and Joe and I and Debbie and I all agree, you were one of the people responsible for making it happen. So thanks a lot. Uh, it, was, it was lots of fun. And it was also, uh, it's great fun to see all you guys as, uh, as friends. Great to see you again. And if the creek don't rise, the good Lord's woman will do it all over again. Right here, everybody. Thanks. Thank right. you. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank Peace. you.